Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Shuma Cast. I am Noel, being joined, as always, by Angie. Hello, everybody. And we have a return guest with us. Everyone, please welcome back J.D. DeMott. Hey! Hey! Thanks, guys. We have just wrapped up the 1990s era of Joel Schumacher, and before we move into the 2000s, we're just going to do a couple episodes here looking at two of the unproduced screenplays for sequels and prequels to The Lost Boys. We are starting tonight with Lost Boys 2, a.k.a. Lost Girls. For years, this script was just available online without any title page or credits, so there was a lot of debate over who actually wrote it. A lot of people thought Eric Red wrote it, but he ended up writing the one that we'll cover next week, which was also online. Mm-hmm. Some people thought Joss Whedon, early in his career, wrote this script mm-hmm. and then turned it into Buffy, but it's like, no. one, I've read enough Joss Whedon, he has specific writing quirks, they aren't in here, and two, nothing in this script overlaps with Buffy at all, other than there's vampires. No, not at all. Mm-mm. It turned out this is ultimately the script that was written by Jeffrey Boehm, who was one of the co-writers of the first film. It was two initial writers did the one where it was young children. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then he came in and did where they bumped it up to teenagers and made a lot of changes with Joel. And him and Joel conceived of the storyline for this one together. And then Jeff wrote the script. And as far as I could tell, this is only a first draft. I don't believe it ever went through any other drafts. Otherwise, I haven't been able to find out any more history about it. I just know Joel's toyed with the idea of doing a Lost Boys sequel, but never fully committed to it. And they just could never quite settle on something he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Since the synopsis is going to be slightly expansive, let's just go ahead and jump into the recommends here. And Angie, do you recommend the Lost Boys 2 script and would you like to have seen it be produced? As it is, no. If this is a first draft, I think it had some potential to maybe go through some rewrites and make it stronger. I didn't realize it was subtitled Lost Girls. That kind of makes me even madder (laughs) because that's my biggest problem with this is for being supposedly about the girls, there's not enough strong definition of the female characters for me to get into them as much. I also feel like it's very much a rehash of the original film. Maybe with rewrites and drafts, you could define those characters a little bit better, maybe make it a little more unique as compared to the first film. But as it is, I wouldn't really necessarily want to see this get made. JD? Maybe it's just PTSD from all of the (laughs) uh, Halloween scripts that you made me read, Noel. (laughs) But I actually thought this was a lot of fun. It is very much a rehash of the original. There are parts that I do think and definitely characters that should be fleshed out a lot more. But all of the returning characters felt like the returning characters. And the fact that it was scripted by one of the people who worked on the original makes sense because the voices are really nailed down. And it's a fine film. Like, there's nothing really offensive. There's nothing that really makes me scratch my head too much. (laughs) I thought it was fun. It's not going to necessarily be a notch on the original, but compared to a lot of horror sequels from like the 80s and 90s, this is actually pretty decent as a follow up. Yeah, on the one hand, I do think it's lively, it's entertaining, it's got snappy dialogue. It would have been fun and had some good zip and excitement to it. On the other, it is definitely a rehash. Mm -hmm. Beat by beat by beat, it is recycling the same story as the first one right up to the very end. It's very much the definition of one of those sequels that let's do the same film but bigger and less well. (laughs) I like some of the new ideas it brings in. I like a few of the new characters, but unfortunately, I wish that those had been focused on more instead of just running Mm -hmm. peripheral to let's retell the first movie. Yeah. And again, for something that was being proposed as being titled The Lost Girls and Joel, even when he would occasionally mention this as, and in the next one, we're going to explore The Lost Girls, it's still a very male-centric movie and the girls are kind of all second fiddle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's dive into part one. We open on the Santa Carla coast, where the surf Nazis are having a bonfire party on the waters in front of the boardwalk. Two women enter, the Lost Girls, Angel and Yvonne. 
One of the surf Nazis forces himself on Angel, but is stopped when a new team of Lost Boys roars in on their motorcycles. Ozzy, Brian, and Red sweep up the girls and drive off. Singled out from the group is Julian, a brooding James Dean type. Later that night, the guilty surf Nazi is sucked up into the sky, his surfboard dropping back onto the sands. At the Emerson household, Michael and Emily are out of town for the summer, while Sam is stuck in summer school with Grandpa watching over him. After waking Sam up with a stuffed grizzly, Grandpa blends him a drink of nasty spoiled food while Sam talks Grandpa into letting him borrow Michael's inexplicably left-behind motorcycle so as to shorten the school commute. Grandpa eventually relents, and Sam rides into town, past new signs warning of frequent shark attacks. Sam largely dozes through a snicker-filled class on the Trojan Wars until Vanessa Harker enters the room. She is, quote, a breathtaking honey blonde, dressed in expensive designer clothes. Her family just moved to town, and she instantly catches Sam's eyes. Later, that classroom is invaded by the Frog Brothers, who want to inform Sam of the latest attacks, but he'd rather chase after Vanessa. We move into Vanessa's home, quote, a stunning two-story country home built near Hudson's Bluff, jutting out towards the ocean, surrounded by acres of pasture land, and meet her parents, Mina Harker, a middle-aged woman who spends her time worrying about how she looks and who she is seen with. Her husband, Boyd, so straight he might as well be a school principal. They're chatting up a local snob couple in prep for a welcoming party. Upstairs, Vanessa broods until she's interrupted by her closet being raided by her sister. Sarah is described as four years younger than Vanessa, but don't tell her that, in that awkward <laughs> stage between tomboy and fabulous babe. Mm-hmm. Ah, screenplay descriptions written by men. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Both sisters are lamenting their lost mother and their father's recent marriage to Mina, which is why they were moved out of Chicago. The girls duck the cries of Mina to show off their wealthy clothes as they sneak outside and ride off on Vanessa's white stallion. They leave the horse to graze as they wander into the amusement park, chuckling figures watching them from afar. Sam is about to head into the comic shop when he sees the girls at the park and attempts to make a dashing introduction in the bumper cars. He has eyes for Vanessa, but instead catches the affections of Sarah, and when the Lost Boys show up and start making a scene, Vanessa finds herself smitten with Julian. As the Lost Boys ride off, Vanessa hops on her horse to follow, leaving Sam stuck with Sarah. She tags along as Sam heads into the comic shop, where the Frog Brothers drag Sam into a back room filled with steaks, holy water, and other vampire-slaying ephemera, and try to convince him the Lost Boys are back. Despite having just been in a scene with the Lost Boys, Sam refuses to believe them. <laughs> and as they head out, Sarah gets into an argument with the Frogs about how they had learned more from reading more than just comics. Brad and Sally, a couple who were accosted by the Lost Boys on the bumper cars, complete with Brad saying, Get lost, boys! <laughs> are the next victims as their entire Ferris wheel car is ripped up into the night sky. Vanessa and her horse continue racing, now along a line of cliffs. She suddenly finds herself surrounded by the Lost Boys and girls on their motorcycles, joined by a pack of bestial hounds of hell. Sarah is startled out of the saddle and falls off of the cliff. She's caught by a flying Julian. The next day at school, Sam notices Vanessa is absent. At her home, Mina is preparing for the big party while Sarah wakes up a groggy Vanessa, who's dismissive of questions and wincing at sunlight. Vanessa also discovers a pair of fang marks in her neck. The frogs ride up to the Emerson house. After sharing a lingering stare with Grandpa, who's digging a hole that looks suspiciously like a grave, they confront Sam with the guest list for the party. Prominently named is the local mayor, Alfred Ulysses Card, a.k.a. Al U. Card, which spells <laughs> Dracula in reverse. And this plot there will never come up again. Well, yeah, Sorry. that's right. He's yeah. in the restaurant, but that's it. <laughs> it ultimately means nothing. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sam tries to shoot them off until he learns the party is at Vanessa's. Cut to the big party, where the swanky social elites are clad in black and powdered white, sipping red wine and eating raw carpaccio. The frogs sneak about, gathering specimens and claiming everyone is a vampire until they're chased away. Sam rings the front door, hoping to see Vanessa, but is instead drooled over by Sarah, then yelled at by the girl's father for messing up the front lawn with his motorcycle. Just then, the Lost Boys swarm in, ripping their bikes through bushes and rose gardens before halting behind Julian at the front door. Vanessa appears, her clothing starting to punk out. She walks right past Sam, her fainting mother, and the mayor's son everyone was hoping to hook her up with, and she climbs on Julian's motorcycle as the pack rides away. The Lost Boys bring Vanessa to the amusement park, which is closed for the night and buried in fog and pitch black. After an argument between Ozzy and Julian, Vanessa is led onto the roller coaster with the pack and clings for dear life as someone keeps pushing the throttle faster and faster. As the cars careen around corners, the Lost Boys stand and let themselves be thrown off into the dark. Vanessa is terrified, but when the ride comes to a close in a stop designed to look like a dragon's head, she finds herself surrounded by the pack and welcomed in by their revealed leader, David. And I quote, back for a return engagement, looking cooler and nastier than ever. End quote. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's just start off here. Angie. <laughs> yeah. Bringing David back. Yay or nay? 
I think that's logical. I certainly expected it, no matter what. I think we even in our episode debated the whole, like, would an antler really kill him? Yeah. It's not that hard to believe that he's back and that they'd want him back. And just like the old Dracula films used to always find a way to bring him back. Oh, yeah. They're going to do the same thing here. Yeah. My only question is, do you know when the script was written? 1990. So that would have been right around the time Kiefer was doing like Young Guns 2. When was the original? The original was 86, 87, right? 87, yeah. They kind of dance around the timeline, but it's about, I want to say like three, four years later. I question if they could have gotten Kiefer back for this. To be honest, I didn't really expect it. It kind of surprised me a little bit. I thought that was kind of cool. One thing to point out is that this script was before Flatliners. Okay. And I know, remember that song Party Town? Yes. Joel originally got the rights to that because he planned to use it for this. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. And then ended up using it for Flatliners when this one didn't get off the ground. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the timeline is in terms of did this fall apart and then he did Flatliners? Was he working on this while in prep for Flatliners? I don't know the level of detail on that one. All I know is 1990. That's all I know on Mm -hmm. the script. Yeah. But yeah, David, there's just nothing really new done with him. Yeah. Beyond whether or not, you know, him being busy, I would imagine that if Kiefer got a hold of this script, he might be like, there's really nothing for me to do here. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. This doesn't seem worth returning for me you know yeah i'm sure he could chew the scenery and make the few scenes he does have fun but beyond the fact that it's like hey it's that guy you remember yeah he doesn't do much i think one of the more interesting and gripping things of the original was the homoeroticism and you don't even really Mm -hmm. get any of that here no you don't so michael and the mom are inexplicably gone for the summer Mm -hmm. do you feel the story works okay without them Yeah, because the focus has at least somewhat shifted to Vanessa and Sam, I think it's okay to not have the two of them there. I feel like they might just be crowding everything. Yeah. Would have liked to have had at least some explanation as to where Star and Laddie were. Yeah. That's true. Maybe they're off with them. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because if you think about it right now, I know Sarah is four years younger than Vanessa. Vanessa is Mm -hmm. in the same grade as Sam. Right. So I'm thinking Sam and her are probably about like 17, 18 at this point. So they're either like juniors or seniors in high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because he has to be able to drive Michael's motorcycle to school. So he has to be at least 16. Yeah. And we never see Sarah at the school. So I'm presuming she's in a junior high. Or she's just not at summer school. Well, it might say it's summer school, so she wouldn't necessarily be there anyway. Well, but if the family had moved to town and put Vanessa in summer school to get her caught up, they would probably do similar with Sarah. Maybe, Mm -hmm. yeah. We only ever see him in that class, though. So it's not like we see anything outside of it. He's just there to read the Iliad all summer. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) What did you think about the characterization of Sam in this one? He feels like Sam, but at the same time, it's Sam trying to be in the more Michael role. He's trying to grow up. Yeah, it's trying to have him grow up a bit, but he's still this awkward dork. That's fair. I mean, he was always kind of that guy. Because he's so focused on Vanessa the entire film until like it's blatantly obvious to him that Vanessa's a vampire, that he really doesn't have much to do other than, oh, I want to take her out on a date. (laughs) That's his whole motivation for like two thirds of the movie. Yeah. To me, the strangest part is why is he so insistent that the vampires are gone? I mean, maybe it's the kind of thing where if we saw it on screen, we could see like he's so afraid of it or he's remembering the pain of that time that he doesn't want to believe it but instead it just seems like the frog brothers keep telling him look see all this evidence and he's like no 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 no. i want to go on a date yeah but you helped kill them why wouldn't you be as into this and be believing of this idea other than i guess it works better for the plot for him to be kind of resistant and in denial well i think it's also that several years have gone by yeah but and he's blinded himself to this kind of return My other thing is that you would think after the first film, him and Grandpa would be a little more communicative of stuff of the supernatural nature. Right, right. And if, as is revealed later on, if Grandpa is secretly going around still killing vampires every night, (laughs) why is he not (laughs) telling the person who knows if vampires exist? Mm -hmm. I'm perfectly fine with that setup of like, it's years later, it's Sam at summer school. Okay, so if we're presuming Sam is like 16, 17, 18, Michael would already be off college age. Right. So that would explain why he's gone. Maybe that would explain why Star is gone, not why Laddie is gone. I would have actually liked to have seen Laddie in junior high. Laddie would probably be Sarah's age. Mm. I think there was more that you could have done. I always loved the teases in the script of the ghouls and werewolves of City Hall, you know, and how there's this deeper supernatural undercurrent going on in this town. And Mm -hmm. I'd much rather dig into that than just let's retread the Lost Boys again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the whole thing 
thing with the mayor being Alucard. Yeah. <laughs> Beyond suggesting possibly he's the head vampire, maybe they're trying to set up a larger continuing series of he's there and you only slowly start to realize that he's the one behind it all, even though it's pretty obvious by yeah. his name that he would be. And maybe that's why he's a dangling plot thread that gets forgotten. And then you have him, you have Mina Harker as the stepmom. Yeah. Right. Who has absolutely nothing to do with anything. I almost want to believe that the caterer slash restaurant concierge, that he was almost a red herring as well. He's the type of person that if we were going to reveal would be a big bad. He's the one I reveal as the big bad because he's the least suspicious, which makes him the most suspicious. I did find that really weird in the restaurant scene. They're like, Filthy little boys. it's Robert. It's like, why do I care that it's Robert? <laughs> I know. There seemed to be like they were setting up a thread there that never really went anywhere. Yeah. I just imagine Robert being played by Bronson Pinchot. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Oh, yes. <laughs> Around that time. Yep. I just want Joel Schumacher <laughs> to do an entire movie about Serge. <laughs> Then as we go into it, though, you have your opening teaser with the Lost Boys encountering someone on the boardwalk and then snatching them into the air. Mm -hmm. And then we have another group of victims that they snatch into the air. Mm -hmm. Instead of Michael seeing Star on the boardwalk, it's Vanessa seeing Julian on the boardwalk. Yeah. You know, then you have the whole, we got to test your faith at midnight by like putting us into a situation where we're going to be thrown off into the night. But now we're on a roller coaster mm -hmm. instead of a bridge. Right. This is where I wish that they had just expanded on the new stuff instead of just constantly retreading the old. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are entertaining scenes, but we've seen them before. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm sure the roller coaster stuff would be really thrilling to watch. Yeah. But why are we starting with the focus on Sam instead of getting to know Vanessa yeah. as she comes to this town? You see her in the moments when you need her there, but then you keep switching back to Sam again instead because you don't know how to write women. I don't yeah, know. And this gets yeah. to my biggest thing. It's because he's the boy. <laughs> Yeah. And it's like the Lost Girls, like Angel and Yvonne sound cool, but they literally just ride on the back of motorcycles and are secondary to the men. Yeah. They're basically the other vampires in the first movie. They don't really do anything. Exactly. Vanessa is basically our new Michael, but she's relegated to supporting status because Sam mm -hmm. and the Frog Brothers need to be the leads. Yeah. If this had been made as is and had been released as Lost Girls, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I think they would have missed the point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when they first introduce Yvonne and Angel, they introduced them as the lost girls and i was like oh this is gonna be a female in pack of vampires mm -hmm. and no it, they're nope. two flunkies amongst four other guy flunkies yeah yeah david decided he was bisexual and he could add more women to his group that's yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty much all there is here it's like wait i think they got the wrong message last time <laughs> There's not even much else to say about the setup because it's the same setup of yeah. the original. I mean, I like Sarah. Sarah's yeah. a fun character. Mm -hmm. I like her interplay with Sam. We'll get into it more in the script as she becomes more involved. But again, she's basically female Sam. Right. She gets a little whiny at times. Oh, yeah. I think they're stressing a little too hard on the she's the little kid that doesn't get it kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. I really wish she was maybe just a year younger than Vanessa because then mm -hmm. you could play with the love triangle a little bit more. Yeah. If they were juniors, she's a freshman, you know. Right. Yeah. It wouldn't be so awkward for her to be hitting on Sam so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Four years isn't a whole lot as adults, but when right. you're in like high school- That's that's huge. That is a huge age difference. Yeah. When you're 17 and she's 13. Mm -hmm. Yeah. First off, you're going to get put on a watch list. <laughs> and plus the script describing her as that awkward phase between tomboy and mega babe or yeah. whatever they say. Like, yeah. it's just, ew. Yep. There's some weird descriptions of female characters in this. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then I think one of the other problems of trying to read Sam is that we don't get to see his wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, imagining that wardrobe on Michael's motorcycle. <laughs> And then imagining Sarah's version of that wardrobe. Yeah. I just want to see this movie just to see how Joel would do the costumes. Mm -hmm. So, Jay, what do you think about how they do Grandpa? It's just more Grandpa, which yeah. is fantastic. <laughs> the whole blender sequence. Oh, my God. Yeah, that is genuinely funny. <laughs> what do you think? I'm going to drink this crap. <laughs> oh. I know later on they repeat some jokes from the original as callbacks, but I don't mm -hmm. think they really needed to do that quite so much. But he's fantastic. You get more grandpa, I think, in this version than you did in the original film. Yeah. I think more grandpa is always good. So no real complaints, though. I would have liked to have seen just like a little bit more exploration as to like why he knows about vampires and why is he the way he is and all <laughs> yeah. this. Just a little bit more. You don't need to go a whole lot because I think he works fantastically as just this kooky old guy who you don't necessarily need a whole lot of backstory on. But just like some hints would be great. Yeah, like 
that whole stuff with him throwing all the weird food into the blender is just perfect gross out comedy for mm-hmm. sure. But I think that first scene with him, you kind of expect him to be around a little bit more. And then unfortunately, we don't really see as much of him through the rest of the film. And they start making suggestions to his origins, which are kind of weird. But I'm glad he's at least here. I'm glad he's not off and gone with the mom and the brother, at least. Yeah, I think my main issue is just, again, that they're just replaying the same arc from the first movie. Yeah. It's just that he's coy and mysterious, and that it turns out to be for the exact same reasons that he was in the first one. Mm -hmm. I would like to have had Grandpa be more of the team. Yeah. Especially after everyone came together in the first film. Yeah, maybe they're thinking that, oh, kids don't want to see an old guy hanging out. Maybe they could have him, like, get injured or something like that, where he couldn't necessarily be active in the big battle. Mm -hmm. but you could still have him play a supporting role, like be the man in the chair or whatever the 90s equivalent of that would have been. (laughs) Yeah. I need to know, though, what happened to his marijuana bush? Wait, he had a marijuana bush? He did in the first one. Remember that one time that Sam actually tried to roll up a leaf? I don't remember that at all. don't. Oh, shit, that might have been a cutscene. Sorry. (laughs) I was going to say, wait, what? (laughs) Sorry, I'm remembering a cutscene. Never mind. (laughs) <laughs> I was going right, to say, I don't then. remember that. So I guess that's why they didn't follow up on it. <laughs> yeah. It's like Sam found a marijuana bush and like didn't know how to smoke it. So he just literally rolled up a leaf and tried to light it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. That was on the DVD. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. Even though they are repeating stuff, I do like that they are trying to at least put slightly different spins, like with the roller coaster. I do like that the frogs trying to prove that there's vampires is at the giant ball where it's like all the rich elite are gathered and Mm. are eating raw beef and drinking red wine. That entire sequence is actually a lot of fun, in my opinion. Mm. Like, especially just Edgar and Alan just doing their frog thing. Yep. Just being totally obnoxious around all these rich elites. At a giant ball, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's genuinely a charming, fun scene. Yeah. Yeah. It is fun. But yeah, I don't know why they brought back the caterer. (laughs) (laughs) No. The caterer gets more screen time in this movie than the nook. (laughs) Aww. The other thing, I keep beating this guy up for his female characters, but Mina is just like a little too... The snobby stepmom. Obvious, obnoxious stepmother. Yeah. Yeah, It's like every single girl is kind of a trope in one way or another here. Yeah, I agree with that. Had this been more of a story focused on Vanessa being in a restrictive household and the allure of the Lost Girls is basically liberating Mm -hmm. her to her own freedom and independence, I think that would have played a lot better. Right, right. This really is missing a lot of that higher level commentary that the first one had. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't think about it till you guys started bringing it up. But if you had Mm -hmm. had it told through Vanessa's point of view and have this kind of dorky, but kind of cute guy who's you're not sure if he's trying to hit on you or if he's trying to warn her about vampires. The way he Mm -hmm. does it is just super awkward. She thinks that he's just hitting on her. And I think you could do this in a way where you present it more like telling the same story, but at least from a different point of view, as opposed to repeating it from Sam's point of view. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's definitely enough here that you could still make this script work with a rewrite. Mm -hmm. It's, again, more about shifting focus, stepping away from the repeats, building up more of the newer stuff, even just finding that character focus. This should be the story about Vanessa's journey, not Sam's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because Sam doesn't really have an arc. He doesn't have a journey in this. No. Vanessa does. Michael did in the first one. And Sarah, you know, trying to save her sister, which is granted very similar to the first one. You don't have that allure of the vampires that you did in the last one. Mm -hmm. So just even before we meet David, anything leap out at you about the new gang of Lost Boys? No, I mean, like you said, they're by the numbers doing exactly the same thing as the last one. They don't have any personalities, unfortunately. Julian seems like a weird love child between Michael and Star, where he's the hot person (laughs) who has no personality whatsoever. Yep. (laughs) Yeah. He gets more story than he deserves, yeah. He doesn't do anything, at least not in this first act, and spoiler alert, not in the second, really, that's really (laughs) worthwhile, other than just be a rival for Sam's affection, I guess. Mm. Yeah, and then like the other Lost Boys are just completely... Blank slates. Blank slates, yeah. Yeah. Ozzy and Red and Brian. They're about on the same level as the Hellhounds or whatever they call it. Exactly. <laughs> and to be fair, like on the page, the remaining Lost Boys were not interesting in the original script either. No. But they were really fleshed out by the actors and the way they were designed. Mm. Yeah. That's why I'm willing to give it a little bit more slack because I can just imagine if you got your next Alex Winters to come yeah. in and <laughs> fill these roles, they probably would have a little bit more personality. Yeah. Sure. But on the page, there's nothing really to them. Yeah. I trust yeah. that Joel would have brought them to life, but they still don't have stories. They aren't characters. Mm-hmm. No. 
All right, well, let's move into part two. That night at Grandpa's house, Sam is awakened by Grandpa, who's clearing his field with sticks of dynamite. After they argue and settle in, Grandpa tries to help Sam with his relationship woes with advice on how to get a lady, which consists of looking her straight in the eyes, saying, you got great hooters, let's do the nasty, and pulling her into a kiss, which Grandpa demonstrates by pulling Sam into a kiss. Mm. At school, after Sam learns the hard way that his teacher and classmates don't believe his homework wasn't finished because of vampires and a dynamite in Grandpa, he runs into Vanessa in the hall. She's gone full lost girl and says she's been looking for him. Sam follows Grandpa's advice, saying, you got great hooters, let's do the nasty, and pulls her into a kiss. She says to meet her that night. In order to make some fast cash for a date, he unloads his old comic book collection on the frogs, running into Sarah at the shop, who's still arguing with Edgar over the legitimacy of comics versus literature. When the frogs refuse to take back his copy of Destroy All Vampires, Sam passes it to Sarah, who treasures getting a gift from him. <laughs> As the sun sets, we zoom into the old lair of the Lost Boys, the mansion buried in a cave. Their old room has been stripped down, the decor piled together in the center of the room. Moving below, we find their new lair, a gigantic dining room with skeletons posed around a dining table, and a mural on the wall of cruel young men abusing an animal, one of whom looks like David. As David drops to the floor and stretches, he lets out a piercing call which wakes the other Lost Boys. As Julian joins them from another room, we learn he hasn't finished his conversion to vampirism yet, and David declares that tonight will be his first kill. At the Harker house, Sarah, while thumbing through Destroy All Vampires, bursts in on Vanessa, who's looking haggard and pale, and uncertain as she preps for the date. While Sarah tries to talk her out of seeing Sam, Vanessa tries to take a shower only to be burned by the cold water. The house is suddenly surrounded by flashing lights and the sounds of roaring motorcycles and the whispering voice of David calling out, Vanessa, Vanessa. The girl's parents are terrified, especially as China and their massive chandelier come crashing to the floor. Boyd grabs a gun and throws open the front door, only for the noise to stop and Sam to be revealed standing sheepishly on the doorstep for his date. When Vanessa appears in a sexy miniskirt, her father protests until she seemingly hypnotizes him. As Sarah follows them out to the car, which is Grandpa's, by the way, she glimpses the couple in a mirror, noticing that Vanessa's reflection is translucent. As they drive off, Sarah runs back upstairs to her copy of Destroy All Vampires and flips to the phone number of the Frog Brothers. Sam takes her to a swanky French restaurant where Vanessa's hypnotism scores them an already occupied table. After they order, she's all over him with kisses and licks, working her way up to his neck. But when her fangs appear, she's suddenly conflicted and struggling with her bloodlust and gagging at the sight of her food. Sam is trying to figure out why she's pulled away and covered her face with a napkin when Sarah and the frogs burst in, making a scene as they try to explain to Sam what's going on, finally using a silver serving tray to show her lack of reflection. When Sam sees this and her still barred fangs, he shouts, Holy shit, I'm on a date with a vampire. <laughs> as more of the restaurant is trashed, complete with Edgar going after Vanessa with a shish kebab, Sarah begs them to instead help since Vanessa obviously hasn't completed the transformation yet. Leading Vanessa out to the car, they're suddenly surrounded by the Lost Boys, but police show up, creating enough of a distraction for our heroes to get away. Taking Vanessa home, Mina mistakes the frogs for a cleaning crew and starts bossing them around until they destroy even more of her stuff, while Sam assures Sarah there is still hope for her sister as they tuck her into bed. Sam apologizes to the frogs for not listening to them before, and the team is once again forged. Checking on a sound, Sarah enters Vanessa's room to find her sister floating on the ceiling. Sarah screams but realizes her sister is scared and asking for help. Unfortunately, their father heard the scream, and as Boyd barges in, Sarah distracts him, even as the bloodless reignites and Vanessa starts moving in to kill her own father. Fortunately, Sarah is able to talk her father out of the room and agrees to help her sister, but she sure as hell isn't going to sleep in the same room as a blood-sucking vampire. Later that night, a stream of mist pours through the seams of Vanessa's window, forming into Julian. He goes to Vanessa, apologizing to her, promising he won't let her fully transform. They fly off into the night together. And we'll stop there because the rest is just leading into the third act. JD, the Frog Brothers. They're still fun. They get a little bit more to do in this script. I mean, it's still pretty much doing the exact same shtick. <laughs> but I like that shtick, so I kind of enjoy this. Their dialogue didn't necessarily have a whole lot of meat to it, right? It was still very much like, we got to kill the vampires, it's important, etc. But it was the kind of thing where I was remembering the first film and those actors, and I knew that they could bring a lot to the performances yeah. that would still make them a lot of fun, even if they weren't necessarily doing a whole lot. It was just happy to see them in more than what, because they really only had like two scenes of the first film, I think. Yeah, like three or four, yeah. Whereas like here, they're more integral part of the group yeah. instead of supporting characters. Mm -hmm. So it was really nice to see them in that respect here. Yeah, a lot of the dialogue works when you imagine Corey Feldman doing a Sylvester Stallone impression again. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. We should have staked her. No. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think, again, their dialogue is super lively and fun. Mm. I love how gung-ho they are until any time they actually run into danger and then they kind of freak out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're like the uh, militant survivalists who prep their entire life for a war that never happens until it does and then they don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They pretty much speak in one-liners up until the point where they actually get confronted with something. Then they're like, oh, shit, what do we do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was kind of thinking of like, well, one of the problems is that they don't really show much growth. But if you think about mm -hmm. it, the first movie was their like first time encountering an actual situation like this. Mm -hmm. And then they've been waiting years to re-experience that thrill. <laughs> so they still have not re-encountered that experience again. Well, they do learn. I guess that might be more in the last yeah. act. But, you know, they're like, well, wait, we went during the day last time let's not do that again <laughs> that was sam that was sam who had that oh, that was yeah. sam yeah. said that i thought that was one of them that suggested oh, that. oh i see that was okay sam. but anyway yeah. they're at least a little bit smarter i think than before yeah but they're still very goofy well and i don't know how you could do those characters where they had grown and matured at least not in a <laughs> well we'll find out when we get to the direct video movies uh well yeah i'm sure we will but <laughs> i'm sure there'll be completely nuanced characters by that point yes <laughs> I just think if you try to like flesh them out too much, you would lose the fun of mm -hmm. the characters. Yeah, I agree. You try to make them deeper than they are, you're going to lose a lot of their charming lack of awareness. Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine the Frog Brothers going to school, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> like maybe they're homeschooled by their hippie parents or something we learned everything we need to know through the pages of the funny books <laughs> right right they're just not they don't live in the real world and that's okay truth always comes with three stables <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the thing where I can almost imagine like a modern version where they're like doing a parody of the Christian Bale voice. <laughs> they're fun. And I like new details like the back room of the store is just full of vampire slaying supplies. It's like, well, where do you guys actually sell the comics? <laughs> what happened to their parents? That's what I want to know. Yeah. They're probably just still stoned. Still sitting in the corner. Yeah. Were the Grateful Dead still around? Maybe they're following the Grateful Dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're away for the summer. Yeah. Any character who doesn't appear in this movie, they're away for the summer. <laughs> Saxophone guy, he was touring for the summer. Yep. His career took off, man. He doesn't have time for the carnival. Oh, yeah. I meant to say, no saxophone guy, zero out of oh. ten, do not recommend, burn this script. <laughs> of all the people who should have come back as the master vampire. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Was saxophone guy mentioned in the first script? No. It was just a band's playing on the boardwalk. I didn't think so. He could have been on the boardwalk again yeah. for this one. We don't know. I would love it if they just walked by and he just standing there like busking <laughs> well on the boardwalk we have dave stewart and his like impressive beard goatee thing <laughs> god damn i would love to have had like seriously like imagine saxophone guy if he had come back as like the main big bad because okay. <laughs> there were some attempts to have him do acting at that point and they did not succeed but it mm. would have been fun <laughs> <laughs> you defeated my vampires but can you defeat my abs no and literally like it's a big vampire saxophone battle <laughs> he uses that for echolocation <laughs> I do kind of find it amusing, the whole argument uh, between Sarah and the Frog Brothers about how, why don't you read any real books? These are the real books. And then it's like, she just dismisses comic books until Sam gives her one and then she treasures it. Mm. <laughs> then we get our rehash sequences like Vanessa floating on the ceiling yeah. or the Lost Boys roaring around a house and causing everything to shake and then suddenly disappearing. Mm. Just give us some new stuff. It is a rehash, but I do think this is probably one of the stronger segments of the movie just because yeah. it does focus on Vanessa like it should. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, as you were reading it, I'm like, oh, I hope that shower scene would have been done tastefully considering she's supposed to be like 17. I like the date sequence. I think that's a really good idea. And that is a little bit different than what we saw before. Mm -hmm. But then the descriptions of her licking him and things like that are like, Ugh. once again, with a rewrite to tighten it up, I think that could have been a really well done scene. Yeah. And then again, like the Frog Brothers trashing a restaurant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. With the same Major D running around going like, oh, you filthy children. <laughs> I just love the whole bit where Sarah yanks an entire tablecloth off to wrap her sister. In. It's like, <laughs> why? <laughs> but again, like you have the whole Mina Harker and Alucard trying to set up their children mm -hmm. together. You would think it's like some kind of a vampire dynasty thing. It never goes anywhere. Yeah. No, it doesn't. It's like the last we see of Alucard and his son is they're in the restaurant. Mm -hmm. And then remember that whole bit where Vanessa's mother is trying to convince everyone at the party that that wasn't my Vanessa. That was just her cousin. Her cousin. Yeah. Yeah. She's not well bred. Yeah. Very awkward yeah. there. It's a lot of lively, fun and entertaining stuff, but there's nothing mm. really under any of it. No. No. 
I do love the whole bit of Sam trying to tell his classroom why he didn't finish his homework. <laughs> and it's because grandpa set off an explosion that destroyed the computer connection that ate his homework. Mm -hmm. And I love the end of that is like, would you believe a dog ate it? <laughs> So Angie, mm -hmm. as a girl, <laughs> does the technique of saying, you got great hooters, let's do the nasty and pulling someone to do a kiss, is that effective? Hell no. Is that how you met okay. your husband? <laughs> Good to know. I'll write that one down. Yeah, write that down just in case you weren't sure. Yeah. No, not a good move. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dating advice from grandpa. I guess the idea is supposed to be that we know it's a horrible move, but she's so desperate to feed. She's in the bloodlust, yeah. That she goes along with it. And so therefore it's funny, but it still comes off as really awkward. Yeah. I think the payoff would be if like Sarah did that to Sam at the end. Yeah. It wouldn't make any sense, but that would be the only way to make <laughs> yeah, that Sam. joke. Okay. <laughs> she tells him that he has great booters. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Well, for this time period, she would have said buns yeah. instead. Yeah. You got great wieners. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly think the majority of that scene was just there just so you could have Grandpa kiss Sam. So yeah. we do have our homoeroticism yeah. in the movie. <laughs> not well. No. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's incestuous homoeroticism as well. Let's not forget that. So. <laughs> well, I mean, we've had how many seasons of Supernatural? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. JD, what do you think about the expansion of the Lost Boys lair where they've cleared out that main entry room and now we have this grand dining room and this ballroom? I thought it was a cool expansion of the original. I think it might have looked cool. It's something that you have to visualize and I'm not always mm. super great at picturing that stuff. I mean, I remember what it was like in the original film, but there wasn't a whole lot there. I can't really imagine it surviving that well to the point where you could actually make it a livable space and have a dining room. It made sense to revisit that since that would be a good place to live if you had to stay out of the sun all day, but nothing really more than that. I don't know that it necessarily makes sense that it's an abandoned hotel that's also a cave or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. But I would love to have seen that dining room set. I could just imagine mm -hmm. all the cobwebs and decay. All the skeletons sitting around the chair. And yeah. skeletons. And it definitely painted a really great picture in my mind. And I like the little added touch of the painting to suggest that David has been around mm -hmm. for quite some time. It's a really nice idea, even if it doesn't make any sense. I think that's a rule of cool yeah. you can get away with. <laughs> well, and that's a bit that they recycled from the original script. It didn't make the final cut, but in the vampire's layer in the original is a painting of an old figure who is Max. Mm. Hmm. And that painting is there. They just, I think they cut the shots where they focused on it because I don't think it was selling. Okay. Doesn't know that they were going to try another stab at it mm. or another stake at it. <laughs> and then the whole thing about the Lost Boys destroy everything in the Mina Harker household. And then she gets the Frog Brothers to try to fix it, to put everything back. And then they just start destroying everything. Mm -hmm. There's not much to her. Like, if you're going to give me the promise of a social elite named Mina Harker in a vampire movie, you got to do something with it. Not just, oh, my things. Yeah. Not just, oh, look, it's a reference. Yeah. Like, that's not enough. Yeah. I really wanted that character to be more. I kind of expected it to be a red herring. They could have played that up and made it more like, well, maybe she's trying to induct her daughter into this vampire ways or something like that. Mm. Instead, just her trying to hook her up with the mayor's son. You could actually have some themes, have her like trying to induct her into her way of life. And here she's trying to be inducted into another way of life that's vampires. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's something that could have been done there, but there's not really any meat to it at all. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's where, again, if you had taken more of a feminist approach to this, mm -hmm. if it were that Mina Harker was involved in things, you could have it. She's trying to induct her daughter into the constraints of a woman's place in old society. And then mm -hmm. the Lost Girls represent the abandon and liberation of going out and being yourself mm -hmm. with Vanessa ultimately then finding that balance in herself where she rejects both and finds her own identity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they have the elements here that they can make a story out of yep once David appears there is no more real I mean well we have the grandpa scene that's coming up but we have no more mm -hmm. of the mystery of who is the big bad because it's David right right don't have David don't have the lost boys have the lost girls and let's kind of reveal early on that Mina is not so much involved with them but as an opposition to them and let's mm -hmm. let that play out over a broad stream of the story instead of trying to be coy and playing a mystery over everything. Yeah, well, and like you said, it wouldn't be as much of a rehash that way, too. Exactly. And I think that would have fit with the elements that they're bringing into the story here. Mm -hmm. Grandpa with dynamite in the middle of the night. It's just grandpa. I... 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, at this point, it's just another shtick for him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's funny. It doesn't really add anything other than set up Sam not having his homework done. Yeah. I do like the scene of Vanessa starting to vamp out. Mm-hmm. I trust Joel that he would have done that shower scene tastefully. Because, mm-hmm. you know, he's never been that hugely into... I think DC Cab is really the only cheesecake he's ever done. And it was still <laughs> a funny scene. Yeah. I also do like the different play on the scene where Vanessa's stuck floating on the ceiling, where the father enters the room and Vanessa almost starts to eat her father. Mm-hmm. Boyd has never really built as much of a character, but I do like that mm-hmm. thread of Sarah suddenly realizing, oh shit, my sister's going to eat my dad. <laughs> mm-hmm. I trust Joel to have executed that with a nice amount of tension. I do like the whole with all the sound and chaos that's going on in the house that Boyd grabs a gun and goes to the front door and opens it. And it's just Sam sitting there saying, uh, hey, I'm here, here for a date, if that's okay with you, <laughs> at gunpoint. <laughs> and then Vanessa hypnotizing her own dad. Yeah. I do think while Joel probably could have filmed it as a glorious music video moment, the whole like description of her and Julian making love and then they begin to float out the window, like really? That's a little cheesy. But I think Joel could have at least made it very stylized and sent it to some good music. It would still be cheesy, but it would be stylized cheesy. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. (laughs) The next morning at Grandpa's house, Sam and the frogs realize they have to kill the new head vampire, but don't know who it is. The frogs suddenly suspect Grandpa due to his taxidermy sleeping through the day and strange reddish bottles of unlabeled soda. Sneaking into his room where he's snoring away, the frogs grab Grandpa by the legs, drag him out the front door, down the steps, and into the sunlight. He rides around yelling, but with anger at how he was woken up. As a result, Sam no longer has Michael's motorcycle. Let's just go ahead and stop there, because that kind of resolves the thread that we had just talked about. (laughs) Yeah. Seeing that Grandpa was played as a red herring in the first film, do you think it works to play him as a red herring again in this one, even though they finally have a payoff for that here? I thought it actually did work. It was just plausible enough of the idea of, oh, maybe he killed Max because it was competition. Yeah. And the whole thing with the bottles, because we've got that scene earlier of him making that disgusting food. Maybe he doesn't understand human food anymore, you know. I think it was well executed enough that I didn't mind seeing it come up again and it worked. I agree. I thought it was a clever note that hit in the original film, but I wish we had gotten a little bit more hints as to like why Grandpa is the way he is. But (laughs) if you're going to explore that a little bit, kind of like the frogs, if you explore it too much, you would probably ruin the character a little Mm -hmm. bit. So just leaving it as a gag is fine. Yeah, and it is a fun gag. I think my only problem is that it doesn't pay off with the frogs just saying, we thought you were a vampire, and then Grandpa being coming involved in the third act. Mm. Yeah, considering that everyone should know, hey, vampires are a thing at this point, so there's really Mm -hmm. no reason to be hiding it. So Sam and the frogs meet up with Sarah, who tells him Vanessa is gone and mentions something about a cave. Sam and the frogs know what that means and decide to attack at night while the Lost Boys are out. That night in the lair, David and the other Lost Boys surround Julian, who protectively shields Vanessa. It's a battle of wills between David and Julian, and Julian ultimately backs off as David pulls Vanessa close and they all soar out into the night. At the comic shop, Sarah is angry that everyone is telling her to stay behind as the others stock up in the back room. Alan Frog stops at a lab table where he shows off a vial of sludge that he claims is a vampire vaccine, but as he drinks it down, even Edgar winces away from the disgusting smell of it. Heading into the garage, they reveal the AVAC, the Automated Vampire Attack Car, a.k.a. the Vampmobile, a sloppily modified Volkswagen microbus with stakes shielding a mounted bazooka and a combination periscope steering wheel. After a dramatic checklist procedure, the engine fails to start, until they push it for a few blocks first. The engine lasts long enough to get them to the cave. After Sam and the frogs discover one of their duffel bags of supplies is filled with a stowaway Sarah, they agree to let her come along, especially after she turns out to be more capable than them in getting into the place, what with her campfire girls training. As they descend past the room from the first film, they hear distant rock and roll. First, they enter a chamber filled with bats who awaken and swarm away, almost knocking Edgar down a cliff. Then they reach the dining room where the skeletons at the table have snakes and rats roiling through their bones. Then they reach a door. When they open it, corpses pile out, all of the victims from the last two movies. Below, in a giant ballroom, Julian and Vanessa have lingered to the side as David and the Lost Boys threw a huge party for a local group of skinheads who are drunk and stoned out of their gourds, and I'm assuming this is where Party Town would play. (laughs) Probably so. (laughs) When one skinhead mentions the munchies, David says it's time for everyone to eat. They head to the dining room where Sam, Sarah, and the frogs quickly hide in an elevator shaft. Sam and the frogs are quick to recognize David and realize he's alive because he staked him with antlers, not wood. Sure enough, David and the Lost Boys start violently feeding on the skinheads, urging Julian and Vanessa to join the fray. 
They, however, have spotted our heroes, and after a tense approach, Julian appeals to them to take Vanessa away while he holds the others off. David sees this go down and roars. The frogs try to stake him with crossbows, but he ducks and they slam into the vampire Brian, who poofs away in a cloud of light and mush. <laughs> Julian makes a stand to buy the others time to get away, and our heroes start climbing. Edgar is the last in line, begrudgingly throwing Vanessa on his back for the climb out, but he's pulled back by Angel, the lost girl. Edgar waves a torch at her, but she calmly blows it out. The rest of the gang are pursued by the other lost girl, Yvonne, who takes a few splashes of holy water to the face, but that just pisses her off even more. They climb into the vamp mobile while she keeps slamming it with aerial attacks, eventually helping to kickstart the engine as she keeps attacking. Sarah mans the spotlight and Sam aims the bazooka and they finally spear her with a massive stake. She explodes. They come across Edgar in the road who lost Vanessa and just barely got away alive. They realize they need some heavier firepower if they're going to win this fight. They steal Grandpa's water trailer, a hose from the local fire station, and wake up a priest to bless the tank. They're also joined by Nanook. <laughs> In the ballroom of the lair, Julian is beaten and bound in a chair, David telling him how much of a disappointment he is. Angel drags in Vanessa and they try to force her to make Julian her first kill. Vanessa unable to stop herself as her fangs appear as she's pushed closer and closer to Julian's neck. They're suddenly interrupted by Sam shouting at them from the shaft. The Lost Boys fly after him, going full vamp as he leads them to where Alan waits with a hose full of holy water. Unfortunately, it only comes out at a trickle, so he tries his best to fend off Red, while Sam and Sarah try to fix the intake hose while being pursued by Ozzy. They manage to stake Ozzy on a stalagmite and fix the hose, and Alan gives Red a full blast with the vampire melting away in the stream. Entering the dining room, our heroes are attacked by Angel, who instantly bites Alan. It turns out his vaccine formula was a success, as her body starts bulging and foaming, and her head twists around so severely that it pops off. She's not dead yet as her headless body continues the attack until Sam kicks her head into the fireplace. As the head burns, so does the body, eventually vaporizing into ash. In the ballroom, they find Vanessa and Julian, but they're vamped out with bloodlust with David laughing over them. Edgar also vamps out, revealing that this is how he got away from Angel. He attacks Alan, who desperately doesn't want to stake his own brother. David goes for Sam and Sarah, but Julian turns on him and the two fly into the air in a brutal vampire fight. Sam and Sarah turn to help Vanessa, but are attacked once more by Ozzy, who's still alive with a stalagmite-shaped hole in his chest. They hit him with their squirt guns, and just as he realizes they've been refilled with gasoline, they light him up. Julian is losing his fight with David when there's a huge explosion, causing the entire cliffside wall of the cave to fall away, letting in the rays of the rising sun. Everyone piles on David, holding him in the light as he's swept up, his body expanding into a vortex which also drags in the hounds of hell, all swirling into the sky in a cloud that takes on the form of David's roaring face before it too explodes. Everyone comes to in the rubble, Sam with Sarah, Julian with Vanessa, and the Frog Brothers reunited. They look up to see Grandpa looking down with his dynamite plunger. We get them all? They did. Good, getting too damn old to stay up every night killing vampires. The end. <laughs> I will say, like the first one, they come up with very entertaining ways for vampires to die. Yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> I always kind of love that line in the first one is like, none of them die the same way. <laughs> yeah. God, especially Angel with the vampire vaccine that works. <laughs> yeah, that whole <laughs> sequence of her head popping off and them having to fight the body. And I'm like, that would have been very interesting to see on screen for sure. It kind of got like a Death Becomes Her vibe or something like it's that. It's like an Evil Dead 2 vibe. Mm. Something that's a little campy. And see, I just immediately went to Bogus Journey and Evil Bill's head and how <laughs> we were playing basketball <laughs> with it. <and> stuff. <laughs> Not quite as grim, yeah. but yeah. So Angie, the vamp mobile. <laughs> want to know how you could possibly drive a gigantic van and make turns and everything with a periscope slash steering wheel. I know. <laughs> because you have no windshield. Right. That part, I think, would have probably had to be changed a little bit. I mean, you could also just make a smaller opening in the front. I think the joke there is they made this whole souped up thing that they've never actually driven before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's a fun device. I'm sure it'd be really fun on screen. They do some really great bits with it. I feel like the whole bit of the engine not working is a little extra frustration yeah. they probably didn't need. I think just having this big bulking thing was probably in and of itself all right. We didn't have to add that, but it's fun. I do love the bit where the engine won't start until she slams into them, and then Sam mm -hmm. yells out, thanks for the jump. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It kind of reminded me of Stripes, but mm -hmm. played even more for laughs. It also kind of reminded me of the van that they had in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoon. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I did like going through the checklist and then like, engine. <laughs> yeah. We need to go check that. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, and then Sarah always being told to stay behind. Yeah. It's like, she's in this. Come on. Yeah. And especially since Sam did the same thing when he was yeah. her age. And then the whole thing of, well, she knows how to, like, tie and climb rope because she was part of the Campfire Girls. Of course. Convenient. Like, that's how she's useful. She wouldn't possibly be useful any other way. And I almost <laughs> think it would be cooler if this entire time, instead of her just being, like, female Sam, she was, like, mm-hmm. uber chipper and resourceful Girl Scout. Yeah. Because that would also be a nice throwback. I know the early draft of Lost Boys 1, when they were all children, the Frog Brothers were twin brother Boy Scouts. Okay. And I think that could just be like a fun little throwback to that idea. Mm -hmm. And so she's like uber peppy and prepared to the point where she's annoying. Mm -hmm. I would like to see that characterization. And then when the chips actually fall, her uber preparedness really comes in handy. Right. Makes Sam appreciate her a little bit more or something like that. Then we got the whole skinhead party. Yeah. What do beautiful female skinheads look like? Do they also have shaved heads? There's beautiful women with shaved heads. I'm not saying they can't. I don't know. There's just something about that whole description that, you know, he had to stress the female skinheads were beautiful. Right. That kind of falls into a trope of, I want to say like one guy on Twitter years ago in the screenwriter section of Twitter challenged every writer to pull out a script that they wrote 10 years ago and look at how they described every woman. Mm. And it's always like a single mom, resourceful, but sexier than she realizes. Stuff like Mm -hmm. that, where it's like every single description of a woman Mm -hmm. has to involve she's sexy right unless she's not like remember the scene at the party where the frog brothers interrupted the fat woman adjusting her girdle yeah, oh, yeah. and she screamed and they screamed mm-hmm. it's dated yep but yeah it's interesting that they would just bring this whole group down to their lair for a party just so they can eat them instead of just eating them yeah you gotta have to wonder like when you're following them down deep into these caves are you stopping to think at all or you're just like hey yeah. food and drugs cool right but i mean two things one david obviously plays with this food <laughs> yeah and two again they're trying to entice julian and vanessa i think by waving all mm-hmm. this food in front of them yeah yeah but i'm kind of conflicted because if i was a vampire on one hand killing skinheads probably a good thing <laughs> eating a skinhead don't know if i would want to do that <laughs> yeah do i really want want to have that in my system all that hatred good thing is you have less hair getting tangled in your mouth (laughs) (laughs) i mean i don't think you can taste the nazism in the blood i don't know maybe (laughs) i don't know i don't know if i want to find out is what i'm saying i hear you i hear you (laughs) it's the other white meat the more insecure kind (laughs) (laughs) yeah it just tastes of ink and insecurity It's, again, I think just an excuse where we could do a big party scene and then another bloodbath sequence. And again, just recreating the original movie with the bloodbath sequence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You could expect that Joel would turn this into like a mini music video. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nothing in the script that I doubt Joel could have directed well and would have made it look interesting and exciting. Right. Right. Because, I mean, especially this is the era where he's still doing Flatliners where it's like super Mm -hmm. eye-popping. My issue is just there's no real underlying what is the story of this movie. Right. The other problem for that whole sequence is now suddenly Julian has to play a big part because it can't possibly just be Vanessa trying to stand up to David and resist him. You've got to have the guy there. She has to have a man to defend her. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It would have been kind of interesting if they had made Julian just succumb to his hunger because then you wouldn't be repeating the whole Michael thing Mm -hmm. and you would have Vanessa have to make a stand on her own. Yeah. Oh God. What if it's in this sequence... Julian finally goes full vamp, and then the fight in the end is not between Vanessa and David, but between Vanessa and Julian. Yeah, that could also be well done. Mm -hmm. Again, that's where we don't need David. Yeah. I mean, this isn't a story that needs David. I mean, I understand the desire. No, it's not. But how do you fill that void without him there is the big bad. Again, we've come up with other ways you can. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of fun stuff, like a whole descending into the caves with the bats and the corpses Mm -hmm. and all that stuff. It's all fun horror movie stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, I love the whole Edgar gets left behind and he's facing Angel and she literally just blows out his torch. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, I could see that being a great visual. I do like the idea of Edgar agreeing to be turned because he's counting on them to kill David in the end, too. That's a really nice touch. Did he do that or did he just try to cover for himself? (laughs) After he comes back to being human, he has a line about it was the only way to go undercover. Yeah. But we don't actually see him opposing the Lost Boys at any point in that third act. He's fighting Alan. Right. Yeah. It'd be funnier if Alan was so like, I got to take you out, man. He's like just chasing after him with a stake while Edgar is trying to use his vampire powers to help the situation. And Alan Mm -hmm. keeps trying to take him out. Well, and Edgar 
he's either faking it or he's turned really fast yeah. considering really like fast. Vanessa yeah. and Michael and all the other times we've seen vampires begin the change. They struggle mm-hmm. with it, yeah. It takes a period of time. Right. And he's, what, a couple hours mm-hmm. between when he gets separated versus when they meet back at the hotel. It's not the best written. Let me put it this way. The I like one. the idea of one of the frog brothers <laughs> temporarily yeah. becoming a vampire. Yeah, no, I yeah. like that. I think that is a nice touch. The guys who are so obsessed with fighting them, one of them becomes them. Yeah. No, and that would be a great bit where like Alan's trying to stake Edgar and Edgar like gets up in his face is like, dude, I'm trying to help you guys out. <laughs> and then suddenly like getting a whiff is like, but your blood smells so good. <laughs> yeah. Well, except that he's got the vaccine in him, so that wouldn't work at that moment, but yeah. I know, but <laughs> shush. Uh, but I... I uh... <laughs> 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 I broke no one <laughs> Oh no, he's turning into Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> I get the job. Do I need to start doing it too? Would that help? <laughs> All right. No. So I, I do like the whole sequence with Yvonne attacking the car and constantly mm-hmm. swooping down and attacking the vehicle, and then they have to stake her in the air. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know why you needed a bazooka to shoot a giant stake when they have crossbows. It's a really big stake. It's 1990. It's extreme. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure this wasn't written by Rob Liefeld? Ooh, Joel Schumacher's <laughs> young blood. <laughs> no, I'm not even going to go there. No. And then the whole plot is they realize they need more firepower. It's like, I instantly thought when they go to Grandpa's house, they were going to get the dynamite. But then I kind of love that mm. they get the water tank. They steal a hose from the fire station and then they get it blessed by the priest. Right, at go the, get the priest. Yeah, at the cemetery. And I love how he's like, don't go to Father Martini for your confession. Like, what? What was that all of a sudden? Okay. He probably keeps <laughs> up with the stories about their vampire slang. So it's like, I want to know what happens. I guess so. World within a world here. So then we get our standoff between the frogs. There's the character of Ozzy, who they never really flesh him out, but he's the opposite of Julian. Like, he's the trusted right-hand man of David. Yeah, he's the Marco of this film, I think. Yes. And then there was the whole bit where he gets staked on a stalagmite, but I do like the continuity that they keep up with. That doesn't kill him, Mm -hmm. but he's just running around with his guts hanging out because he has a giant stake shaped (laughs) hole in his chest. Mm -hmm. Right. So they use the fire hose to take out red, Mm -hmm. and he just melts away in a blast of holy water, and then they do nothing else with the tank of holy water. Right. (laughs) Like, how much water did it have? I almost expected them to bring the hose down to the ballroom and put it on a sprinkler, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Just spray the entire room with holy water. They ultimately take out Ozzy with the squirt guns full of gasoline. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess they wanted to do everybody differently, which makes sense. But yeah, it is a little silly that you build up this whole thing of a big old full tank and then you only use it once. Yeah. And then the whole thing about how is there a kink in the hose when he's standing right at the tank? Mm -hmm. If you have an intake hose where you're taking in water from a different source, then why do you need the tank? (laughs) And then how do you have it be holy water if you're taking it as water from a different source? I'm just not understanding the logistics of that sequence. Like you could have had Edgar like sabotage something and maybe he's not really turning the wheel or something like that to make it pump out. Right. Yeah. There's some way you could have made it work and not make it just, oh, it got kinked. Mm -hmm. That's kind of one of my other issues with the script is the timeline. I wanted to say like eight, nine days go by over the course of the script, even though it doesn't feel like it. We have the scene where David says, and tonight we're going to take you out for your last kill. And then the next scene Mm -hmm. is at daytime, and then we cut to a scene at nighttime, and then we cut to a scene at daytime, and then it's like two nights later within three pages, and David's like, and now we're going to take out for your another last kill. The timeline is just so jumping all over the place between when it's day and when it's night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even here, all of this stuff all happens in one night all of a sudden. David confronting Julian, and then our heroes coming in, and then suddenly there's skinheads at a giant party there. It's probably the kind of thing where if you were doing more rewrites and stuff, you probably would have cleaned that up and condensed it to fewer days. So Nanook finally does something, (laughs) fends off the Hounds of Hell, which were so prominently featured throughout the story. I forgot their original debut because when they were suddenly in the ballroom, I'm like, oh, there's sounds now? They just popped up during one of the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like, okay, he's got, all right, well, they didn't have that in the first movie, but okay, sure, fine. Well, they did. They had Max's dog, which was described in the original script as a hound of hell. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And when they were running from him at the gate. But yeah, I thought there was so much more that you could do with them, with Nanook. I mean, obviously it'd be tricky because you have to film Mm -hmm. with dogs, but it doesn't even try to do something. Not really. Yeah, I think it was just something where the writer had an idea and figured he'd flesh it out later or something. Mm -hmm. 
And then David and Julian having a midair battle, which we've never seen before. Mm -hmm. Doesn't remind me of anything. I don't know what you're talking about. Not at all. Right. I mean, again, honestly, just changing that to Vanessa would have instantly put a different dynamic on it. That's Yeah, we have no frame of reference for Julian. We don't care about him as a character. Very similar to Star, I guess, because Star didn't have much characterization either other than tempting Michael in the first movie. But yeah, he gets the climactic battle. It's like, nobody cares. Yeah. If this had been a gang of lost girls and this had been, let's say, Angel Mm -hmm. is the leader of the lost girls. And we did do that plot with Mina. The lost girls helped Vanessa liberate herself from the old life of a strict society. And now Mm -hmm. she is liberating herself from the anarchy of the lost girls. And that's where, again, she's Mm -hmm. finding more of like a center road. This is who I am. Mm -hmm. That would have instantly given the story much more weight. Yeah. So then the twist of Grandpa dynamites off the entire side of the cliff. I do like that. Yeah. I mean, it was set up at least. Yeah, yeah it's set up, but it is a repeat of the original. Mm-hmm. At least it doesn't have that da 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 I mean, he could have rigged his plunger for the dynamite to <laughs> make that noise. Yeah. But I like that twist. And then that's how Grandpa appears. It's just dynamiting off an entire half of the vampire's lair and exposing them to the rising sun. Yeah, it's just like we said, it's just too much of a repeat of the original of him coming up to save the day again and literally having like the last line. Right. I think if Grandpa had been more involved Mm -hmm. and instead of going back and getting the water trailer full of holy water or you get both, you get the water trailer and you get the dynamite. And part of it is let's use the hose full of holy water to distract the vampires while we go around and place dynamite to blow Mm -hmm. this place up. And then there's something goes wrong with the water trailer and then they have to improvise that would have been more interesting it just hits too many of the same beats again it's like the vamp mobile doesn't really ultimately get used for much given how much they set it up Mm -hmm. like that should have been set up earlier in the story and used throughout Mm -hmm. and then the whole everyone piling on david to hold him in the sunlight and then he becomes a swirling vortex that sucks (laughs) up all the hellhounds and then becomes a giant cloud of a roaring fanged out face of david in the sky and then the cloud explodes And let's not forget, it's so huge that even Boyd and Mina feel it at their home and their stuff breaks yet again. That's right. It creates such an earthquake that it breaks all the rest of their stuff. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Because, you know, they're rich and they're only concerned with material things. Right, right. And then Grandpa revealing that the reason why he stays up all night is because he's been killing vampires. But that's not really a surprise. We've known this. Right, exactly. Yeah. And why haven't he and the Frog Brothers and Sam been working together the whole time then? And yeah. yeah. I mean, it's been like three years since the original. Him and the Frog should have been in business together by now. Right. Yeah. Even if Sam was trying to get out of that lifestyle, him mm-hmm. and the Frog yeah. should have like bonded. And maybe that even yeah. creates some resentment because he sees that Grandpa and the Frogs have grown closer than he and his own Grandpa have become. Mm. Now that could be like fueling some of his resistance to get involved with the Frogs because he resents them for being closer to his Grandpa than he himself is. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I think we've had a number of ideas that we could have done a better second draft. Right. Yeah. And then the whole culmination of Vanessa and Julian, was anyone invested in that? Uh, no. No. And then the whole culmination of Sam and Sarah, where her lifeless body is in the rubble and he finally realizes his feelings towards her. And then she suddenly wakes up and is like, yeah, I've been awake this whole time. I just wanted to see if you still care for me. And they just lets her fall. Hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. And then the Frog Brothers reunited. You tried to stake me. You were a vampire. (laughs) It's the only way to go undercover. But she actually didn't do anything undercover. (laughs) (laughs) That's for the second draft. It could have (laughs) worked. I think what we're saying is that I wouldn't have completely thrown out this script, but it needed a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think since he worked on the first script, build those voices of the established characters and build this idea and then maybe bring in a female screenwriter who actually (laughs) understands women. Yes. And can present her own ideas and start to evolve this. And yeah, there's potential here. It's just not there yet. Yeah, no, that would have been great. And I think it's also worth pointing out that even though he did do a big rewrite on the original, Jeff Boehm isn't the one who created the original plot. Mm -hmm. He was just a writer who came came in to punch it up and rework it. So I wonder yeah. if maybe that's where he kind of struggled with, where do we go from here? Maybe so. Yeah. Like I said, I think all the returning characters, like their voices feel yeah. like a perfect mm-hmm. continuation of the original. And a lot of the gags feel like perfect continuations yeah. of stuff that were set up in the original. It's just like, as far as the plot, there's nothing new here. Yeah. yeah. What is new is just bare bones. It's like, oh, what if girl? <laughs> the new stuff is all secondary to rehashing the old stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And again, just that Joel was proud of doing a story with Lost Girls and this is what you were going to do with Lost Girls, really? Right. 
Though it makes me wonder if maybe he also decided yeah. to pass on it because it was too much of a rehash. Because yeah. we've seen so many times he doesn't like to do the same thing over and over again. Right, yeah. right. Because, yeah, he's always been very resistant to doing sequels. Mm-hmm. Maybe, yeah, he just saw the script and was just like, it's just not working for me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it might be why it never moved forward. Yeah. So, Angie, any final thoughts on this? I feel like I've said everything. I don't, you know. Yeah. J.D.? Yeah, it definitely wasn't a great script, but I think there's enough fun here that it would have been perfectly okay. I have a feeling this will be better than the direct-to-video sequels we're going to get to eventually. (laughs) Oh, God. I might be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. Hey, Corey Feldman had direct creative control on those, man. Okay, then I will trust in the Feldman. (laughs) But until we get to those, I just have a feeling that this might have been a better version of what we get. Oh, no. We'll we'll get there when we get there. Yeah. Again, had they filmed this script as is, I'm sure I wouldn't have hated it. I think it still would have been lively and entertaining and looked great and had some exciting editing and everything. It's just not an interesting story. No. Right. If they had just focused on the elements that were interesting and built them into an interesting story, which they have there, they have the pieces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They just needed to move away from rehashing the original one and just figure out how to focus on those pieces that are telling the more interesting story. Yep. So this concludes our discussion of Lost Girls, Lost Boys 2. Thank you for joining us, J.D. Yes. Thanks for having me. Hey. (laughs) Hey, see what I did there? (laughs) Good night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot.com. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were both created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. <laughs> <laughs>